Okay, I, I just uh, I have some thoughts that I uh, things that I thought up a few hours ago. Uh, this is what I strongly believe in, as I have been uh, talking about for for some years now. And uh, this is the importance of uh, telling stories. Uh, first of all, I, I think we all know that uh, we belong to uh, first uh, a global culture. Uh, you cannot say that uh, anymore that we do what we want to do in our own country or in our own home and that's it because since we interact with the world, the world either knows us or doesn't know us. And the uh, other thing is that uh, we, we are all aware, I think uh, whether consciously or not, that we belong to what we might call a non-mainstream culture. Because the dominant culture in the world is uh, Europe, European and American. And uh, if, since we live in the same world, if we visit there, they visit us, we read their books, we hear the news that comes from there, then uh, at some point you ask yourself, but where am I in all this? That, that, all this that I read and all the news that comes to me, you know, where do I belong? And so my, my point of entry into this uh, discussion then is that uh, to stress on the importance of telling our stories. We tell stories first uh, to entertain. Uh, that's the most basic function of, of a story. Uh, and you know, you tell a story, you enjoy yourself, and you, you, other people enjoy the story. And you know, that, that traditionally, or at least when you were growing up and your grandmother or your mother told the story, that was it. But outside of this entertainment uh, paradigm, there are other uh, reasons, uh, other uh, contexts in which stories uh, become important. The first is that it allows us to express ourselves. We, uh, and there are so many people in fact who say, I want to write a story, I, I want to write, I am, I am writing. Uh, and that need, you know, because you ask yourself, what's the point, you know, why, are you waste, why are you wasting your time? But people need, some people need, many people need, some can do it, some cannot do it. But there is the need to express oneself. So of course, you can do it via stories, or you can do it other ways, music or painting or whatever. And then, when you tell stories, you will learn about others when you read a story. And you empathize with each other. So you tell a story and you tell, people learn about you, you learn about them by reading or hearing their own stories. So this is how we sort of connect with each other as people because every person in a way is a private person. There's a wall around him or her. And uh, when you express yourself, you somehow go outside that wall and uh, you, you learn more about someone else or some other people. And if it's a writer, then you learn more about uh, the writer or at least you learn something that's not only you. Right? It's a very complicated thing, but anyway. And then uh, an important function of a story in the political sense is that we tell others about ourselves. By others I mean people who, are, who do not belong to our culture or to our country or to our community, to our race, whatever. So we tell outsiders about ourselves, about who we are, how we think, why we do certain things and so on. And you know, you know, we do that all the time since we were children. When I was young, we were reading stories that were written in England, you know, and then later on they were written uh, uh, in the United States or in Russia or wherever. And then, of course, you know, in that kind of a situation, you learn about other cultures. And yeah, I, I remember even when I was young, I was just wondering when would I read. And I remember it very consciously, you know, and I'm sure a lot of you have also thought about this. When will I read something that's not set in London or in the moors of uh, England or in New York or Los Angeles, but in Dar es Salaam, you know, I mean, this place is as exciting as anyone anywhere else. And so, you know, I remember as a child thinking about that and, uh, you know, it is a very important uh, question that uh, as we grow older and we feel the need to express ourselves, we try to address. Now, having said this, uh, I think we all, agree more or less that uh, in this society, of course there's a lot of telling stories, you know, it's like a bigger soul guy, you know, you tell like, people, you know, <laughs> a lot of bullshit, 
but to tell formal stories, that of course has uh, almost, you know, is it, let's say, a very low level of activity. In the early 1960s, when African literature sort of somehow emerged uh, in the world, was, it was a very exciting period, and it was Achebe and Gugi and so on. There was, then I remember in our, even in our own high school, that uh, my, my headmaster, Peter Palangio, brought Ajayi to our school and he brought other writers from South Africa to our school and there were writing competitions and there were poetry competitions. And he himself, he, although he didn't tell us, was a closer writer. So he wrote one novel, uh, you know, Dying in the Sun. <laughs> so it was that kind of uh, time, but you know, slowly, whatever reason you want to give, uh, unlike Kenya, for example, it has died down. Unlike even Zanzibar, you know, because Zanzibar is tells a lot of stories, <laughs> whether we like it or not. I, a couple of years ago, I came across an interesting uh, statistic uh, from UNESCO. And I think this tells us uh, in very dramatic form uh, how unequal the cultural exchange in the world is. Uh, this this uh, statistic was a little old, but I don't think it has changed too much. And it gave the number of books published by different different countries in the world. And I looked at Tanzania, it's about 300, maybe 350. Kenya was a little higher, 600, some, something of that order. And then we looked at the United States and the Great Britain, it was 100,000. So now, you know, that already tells you that there's something. And of course, there's many of those 100,000 books, they had come here. I went to the Tanganyika Library Service today and uh, Look at the books. There's one Achebe, there's one, there's no movie. <laughs> there are other people. And, uh, and then everything else from other countries, whatever, some expatriate, uh, some Canadian, you know, brings an Alice Munro and some American brings a Saul Bellow and so on. So it's that kind of thing. Whereas the literature books that are published here, or at least that tell our stories, are not there. And this is a symptomatic of. Uh, of a global situation, uh, which is, uh, I think, very, very serious. And, until about 10 years ago, I remember feeling very frustrated uh, watching television. So you look at the world news and look at the weather map. Now, you know, here, with 10 newspapers and all kinds of exciting things happening, one is not aware of how the world sees us here. But when I'm there, when I live there, you know, until, as I said, 10 years ago, you look at the weather map, you know, the weather map, there was no Africa. <laughs> well, Africa was just space. There was no, you know, as if weather didn't exist here because it was not important. And now, of course, they put it there, but they will put Cape Town and they will put uh, Nairobi you know, and so on. And I think it's the duty of every person who lives in any society to make themselves felt. Uh, and finally, I will just say how I began. I began with a similar situation, as I said, uh, a kind of. Uh, a feeling that uh, my stories were not told and especially when I had got a job at the University of Toronto about 30 years ago and I, I, I somehow felt at that point it was a kind of a, a moment in my life where I felt that all the stories that I grew up with that I thought and other stories that I thought I would learn you know, from my elders and some historical stories that you know, we learned in the histories and some that we would find out and they would all be lost. The generations would die out, other people would forget and uh, it's as if you are adrift without an anchor in the world and uh, you, know, you don't have uh, uh, and you have all these memories with you. you know? I remember I could, I could trace every store on Uhuru Street. You know? it, it, uh, that was my world. You know? uh, and. Uh, and I thought that world is going to go away. And I, at, at that point, since I always enjoyed writing, or at least I liked writing, I made the decision that I will, I will write whatever happens. And so I started writing stories. I, I told myself that I will imagine a black space, kind of dark space, without light, so you can imagine a blackout. And then one by one, through, through a story, one story at a time, bring alive the street, Uhuru Street. The story of one person here, one shopkeeper there, one flat there and so on. So I wrote a collection of stories that were set in Uhuru Street. And for me that was bringing alive 
Kapoor Street, which I thought I would otherwise lose. And I, I guess that's how I began, to, that uh, for me, uh, writing stories is of course an end in itself. I, I don't think I could survive if I didn't write. But if I were asked what I accomplished, then I would say I accomplish, I, I express myself, I create the world in which I grow up, the world to which I still belong, and uh, it's my, also my contribution to that world, you know, to, to make its presence felt uh, in, the, in the rest of the world. You know, because as I say, we live in a world where there's interaction, we read about uh, other places, and then we find that uh, in those other places, are able to be there and see whether your world exists, it doesn't. You know, what the world knows of Africa is AIDS, war, hunger. Uh, and when you come here, you look at all uh, the activity, you wonder uh, what, 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 what's going on. And that is a fact. Uh, and I have to tell people, look, when I go to Dar es Salaam, I don't see people dropping dead on the street. You know? <laughs> the population has increased four times, something must be happening. <laughs> So I, I guess that's where I want to end, and then uh, yeah, and then uh, one thing that is very important uh, in Toronto, then uh, as I said, you don't see even now. You might see things fall apart. But that's about it. You will not see other African books. You will, now you will see Asian books. But when we were uh, in the university, if you wanted to read B. S. Naipaul, for example, if the bookstore would have to order it. So we then we thought what we should do is to start uh, our own activity, and we started by uh, founding a literary magazine. And this comes from the same tradition in which we grew up here. This is the I come from the Kujitegemea generation. You, know, you don't wait for others to do it for you; you do it for yourselves. So we thought that there's no representation of us or our culture or our stories here, so we will start our own magazine. Now, I must warn you, if, if you are thinking about it, it is a very foolhardy uh, you know, kind of activity. Uh, it's a mad, the only people who are mad would do it, but then, as we know, some of us are already mad. So we started this and we never got out of it. Very often we ask ourselves, why on earth did we get into this? But we did. So we, then what we did was we started, uh, we registered the organization and uh, we started asking around you know, who's writing stories, who's, who will write a review and so on. So we collected a group of people from, uh, from South Asia, from the Caribbean, a few from Africa. In those days there were not many. And we started putting uh, things together to publish and uh, we did not wait. We put our own money into it. We did our own uh, layout and so on. We learned our own uh, editing because editing is a very professional uh, activity. So we had a friend who was an editor and from that uh, we learned how to edit manuscripts. And, uh, and we just brought out a, a magazine of 112 pages. And uh, I, all I can say is the first time you see something that you produce, it's a thrilling experience. But it's something that you, at least some of us have to start to do it, uh, to start a movement. And when that goes on for a while, then you, you find that uh, maybe you've made a difference, that there is a growing literary culture or something is happening and something new is happening and new writers are emerging and so on. But it's something that you cannot leave to others to do for you. And some people, who are serious about the literary culture would then would have to uh, go do that kind of activity. Unfortunately, uh, I say this uh, with a little bit of uh, trepidation. Uh, see, in Africa, somehow one gets used to the fact that others will do it for us. You know, that the money will come from somewhere else. Uh, that I think is a, is a trap. It's a drug that uh, unfortunately is infected. Uh, this culture, but uh, there are enough people here who can uh, support themselves and do these things. It's not an easy thing to do. I mean, we've had, uh, you've sacrificed your own money sometimes, you sacrifice your time, 
and you sacrifice your personal life because to do this kind of a thing consumes your life and you find that even your relationships suffer but it's a madness as I say that some people have and they do it but it's not something that you I think it's your, your culture, your life, your soul, your stories that you have to take care of yourself. So we, we can now dis, dis, have a discussion based on this and you can ask me questions or ask yourself questions or whatever.